Honey Honey Lion is all finished and I'm getting ready to go out on tour. The first thing we have to do is wrap the bus. For that, we go to Florida Coach outside of Orlando, Florida to let you see exactly how the bus is decorated. The bus is all done. Our drivers, Rich and Chuck, have started out. They're on their way to Norwell, Massachusetts, and we're waiting for them. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Yeah. My cousin. <laughs> I followed and over to my cousin. I like the mode of transportation. Hey, you're going to go all the way to California? Whatever it says in that bus, is where we're going. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. We're on our way, 23 cities in 15 states in 18 days across the U.S. At each stop, I get to visit, sign books, and show everyone how to draw the lion from Honey Honey Lion. Hedgie's always there to greet me. And Hedgie, thank you for being here. You're very attractive this morning. Wonderful stature and what a guy. <laughs> Now I'm going to start with a very boxy rectangle. And that's going to form the lion's body. And I'm having this lion on all fours like this, but he's going to turn his face towards you. So there's a square, a uh, rectangle, but a boxy one. And then halfway through, I'm going to put a line because his body's going to be on the top, his legs are going to be on the bottom. And then I'm just going to color over it with my colors and my outline. This would normally done, be done in pencil, which I would erase. And now there's a, but you can't really see pencil from way back there, so that's why I'm using the gray marker. So there's a box on top resting on one of the corners. So the rectangle has four corners, and on this one it has a little box resting out, and that's going to form the lion's neck. And then I have a triangle with a point pointed downward on top of the box. And if you, most of the cat family have a triangular shaped head. So now I'm going to just turn this so everyone can see. And you can see that there's a rectangle, a square, and a, and a triangle pointed downwards. And then I'm going to put a um, circle right here because, whoops, a circle right here because I'm going to do a little detail that I think is kind of fun with a lion. Because it's just a few little lines that, to me, say lion. Now I'm going to just make an outline now which is kind of the second part of the process of drawing this lion. And I'm going to start with his back, and he has kind of a swayed back, because right under that line, that would be where his backbone or spine is. And this is a very powerful animal that makes short bursts of speed and needs a powerful jump or lunge to, to get the animal that is his prey. And that backbone is very flexible and almost acts like a spring. So he can spring off those hind legs and bounce almost up into the air and to attack the, the animal that he's chosen to take down. And then here's his, his tummy halfway down the box and it's bigger and then kind of goes up to meet his hind legs and his big lungs are inside there where he breathes big gulps of air so he can get um, energy to leap and run after his prey. Because a lot of the animals that this lion would use as food 
can run faster than he can, but he can run very fast in short bursts. So there's his front leg coming down, and then this is the ground line, and so this second one doesn't come down quite as far because it's behind this first one. And if you think about it, his front legs don't come from one place. One is on either side of his chest. So that's why this one is back a little further. And then here's his back leg. And the hind legs are always the hardest to do because they have a bend in them. And the lion uses that bend to spring from. It's almost like he's standing on his toe and he springs up. And when I was little, I loved horses. I was horse crazed. And I only drew horses until I was in seventh grade. So everything I draw always has a little horse in it. So when I'm drawing, I always say, it's not a horse, it's not a horse. <laughs> it's a lion. So there's my lion, this other foot in the background. And then his tail does not come out here. It comes out, it's an extension of his spine. He'll use that to balance him when he's making these giant leaps. And then it has a tassel on the end that's a darker color. And then I can start with his head. And here, I, on each point of the triangle up top, I put an ear. And about two-thirds of the way down the triangle is a small triangle, and that's his nose. And then this is the part that I love, is his muzzle. It's a, three lines that intersect. And if I take this circle, it's almost as if I'm dividing the circle into three, or it could be like a peace sign, and the nose would go up here. And that's the way the lion's muzzle looks. It's a very unique kind of muzzle, almost looks like he's got a downward-looking um, mouth. And then underneath there is a big fluffy chin that's white, because most of him will be all tawny, but he has that white. And then his muzzle is quite squarish, and then I'm following that triangle to show his head. And then in the middle, on either side of his nose, will be two small triangle shapes like this that will form his eyes. And then I'll put pupils in his eyes. And then his mane, which goes, grows down in front of his ears, and then up above and around his head and down joins his shoulders and comes way down his back because this is one of the older male lions. Now I chose to draw, I'm just going to show the outline to everybody over here. I chose to draw a male lion because I want to show that contrast of his mane and then his body, which are two different colors sometimes. And I was so amazed in Africa that you could get really close to the lions because during the daytime they have been, they've killed an animal at night and now they're resting and they have big fat tummies full of food and they just play like kitty cats. They're on their backs and licking each other and batting each other playfully and chasing each other's tails and we'd be so close like from here to that badger. That's how close we could get to them. So I said, Ollie, how can we get so close to these lions? And he said, well, we're on a reserve. There's no weapons allowed. And they look at this big truck with six people on it, and they think it's just one giant creature that never hurts them. And they don't think of it as people. But he said, but if a person got off the truck, then all of a sudden there'd be a person, and then the lion might think it was prey. He would think it was prey. And one time when we were um, parked looking at some lions, Somebody, one of the tourists lost his camera overboard, his camera case overboard, so he just put one leg over and then got out on the ground. And those lions that were just look, lolling on the ground, all of a sudden one leaped up and got in the crouched mm -hmm. position. And his, the thing that was amazing were his eyes because he was just playing and then all of a sudden they became like laser beams just zoned in on that tourist and he like, concentrated and was all intense about it and started stalking and the end of his tail is twitching like this. And that's when Ollie pulled the tourist back into the truck <laughs> and said, don't get out of the truck. <laughs> and that's why when we stop to have a little cup of tea, we always make sure that we weren't near a big bush because there really are what cats all over Africa, lions, leopards, and um, cheetahs that are looking um, for any opportunity to have a good meal because they have to eat every couple of days or they'll become weak and then they can't hunt. So that's what I decided to draw for you today is that intense look of that lion as he notices the tourist's camera goes overboard and that one leg starts coming off that truck. So now I'm going to color him in and I've chosen kind of a tawny shade 
And the lions vary quite a bit in color. Sometimes they're a, a, a light yellow color, and sometimes they're a reddish brown color. But the ones that I liked the best were the ones down by the Kalahari Desert that were tawny in their body, but then they were, um, had very dark manes and the tip of their tail was dark too. So I've to chosen kind of a tawny shade to block in the color. And when um, we, we got to see these lions close up and I said to Ollie, boy, I'd give anything to go and pat that lion's mane. This is the same color. I'm just finding one that's nice and juicy. Um, I would love, give anything to touch those lion's manes. Have you ever done it? And he said that, yes, he had. That one time in his village, he had lived in Botswana his whole life. One time in his village, a lion got caught in some wire. So they called a biologist. And the biologist came and... Uh, darted him with a tranquilizer so they could free him, which just puts the lion to sleep for a couple of hours. And Ali got to pat his mane. And he said it was very rough. And you could see why they had these big manes to protect them, because the lion sometimes will fight um, for territory, like who's going to be the head of the pride. And that, that mane protects them from being killed, because their paws are huge with big claws on them. So now I've got his tawny color shaded in, put in. And now I'm going to do his mane. And this is a Kalahari lion. And when you talk about a lion's family group, you call it a pride. They live in prides. And this, um, usually they would have two boys and maybe one boy and then a lot of girls. And the lionesses, which are what the girls are called, they are the one who, who do the hunting. And they would go and catch, like let's say, an impala. And then the male lion, which you could see under the tree, he just is immovable, looking like a sphinx. And then he just slowly walks over, runs at the girls who have caught the prey, takes it away from them, eats as much as he wants. And then when he leaves, then the lionesses come and with their cubs and they finish it. But I guess there's enough for everybody because it seems to work for the lions. And they're very intelligent animals. And you can see the different prides will even change the way that they hunt according to what kind of animals are available to them. And I noticed up in Chobe, which is further north in Botswana, there were prides of like 40 lions, and they had learned to take down elephants. And then there was another group that were down by Zaipan, which is, when I say Zaipan, it's got a click in it. That's a click language of the um, San people. They, they would learn to triangulate. So they'd see an impala maybe coming to the water hole, and there would be three on, on each side of the uh, little group of antelopes. And each one would move in a little bit on their tummies, a little closer, closer, and closer, and closer. And then finally, one would, when one um, of the impalas wasn't concentrating and looking around for danger, it would lunge and get that impala. So that was, I really didn't like to see the uh, animals being killed, but it was interesting to see how they survived. So now I'm going to, now that I've blocked the color in, I'm going to take out my gray and do a little modeling. So I'm just going to show the color blocked in to everybody over there. And I don't want him to look flat. I've just done the outline. And I'm just going to feather a little bit of gray under his tummy so it looks round. I hope it's starting to look a little round, using feathering strokes. And then under his backbone, this is where the tummy bulges out again. And then under his tail, there's a little bit of a shadow. And I could actually go around all my outlines with this gray, and it would create more of a rounded look for the lion. Because there's very few animals in nature that are flat. <laughs> and this, little, this back leg is shaded a little bit. It's further away from us, and the shadow would be coming down from that hot sun in Botswana. And I'll try to make a few lines that indicate those strong muscles. And he's a very fit lion, so you can just see his ribs in the front. He has a big muscle here and those powerful, powerful uh, legs. And then the fun part is his, his face, because again, we're looking at his face to see what he's thinking. So I'm shadowing down here under his chin. And then down his nose, a lion has a very long, long nose inside of his ears. And then I'm going to take my thin marker and do a little bit of detail. First, I'll make his nose kind of a pink color. 
which I know is many people's favorite color in this room. <laughs> now my little magic marker is right here. Okay. Now one thing that, I, that is so much fun, if you ever go to Africa, you'll learn to do this. The first day you're there, you can say, oh, I can tell which is the male lion from the female lion. The next day you're there, you're saying, oh, well, now I can tell the old lions from the young lions, and I can tell the young year-old lions. Well, if you live in uh, the bush like Ali has his whole life, he can see maybe 50 lions in six months. He recognizes each one as an individual because he's so attuned to looking at their faces. And that's what's so fun about going there is you have this, you just learn so much every minute from your senses being exposed to all this wonderful place. But he looks right around, um, above their eyes, there's like a little bunch of fur. And lions don't have eyebrows, but when I'm doing my drawing, sometimes I'll make the bunches of fur look like eyebrows because we're used to human expressions. And when an artist does that, overlays the emotions of human on an animal, we call that anthropomorphic. So any of the children there that like to learn new words, that's a really good one, anthropomorphic. It makes um, human feelings on an animal. So here's this, almost like little eyebrows, and he's just looking very, very intense, as if he's just seen that camera case go overboard. <laughs> and then he has uh, some lines here where his whiskers come out. And there, there he is. Now, it usually takes me an hour to do an inch, so I'm going very quickly today. I don't have a cookie timer, though. It's just, well, I feel like when I'm done is when I can walk into the page. But when I average it out, it does take a long time to do a drawing for me. And there's my name, and I'm going to put the date because I want to encourage all the kit children here to sign your work and to put the date on because drawing is just like riding a bike or playing a musical instrument or playing basketball or learning cursive. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And sometimes it's not the people that are so gifted at drawing that turn out to be the best artists. Sometimes it's the people that just like to be by themselves and create a world and they practice, practice, practice. So I'll just have one more thing to tell you. Thank you, Jill. And then we can have the book signing. And the thing I want to tell you about is about your creativity. And if all the children here look at their finger and their thumb, you can see that you have like little lines in your skin. And that's called your fingerprint. Everyone has one that's different in the whole world. No one has a fingerprint just like yours. It has a little design in it. And that's the same way with the way you tell a story, whether you tell it in pictures or in words. It's absolutely your own because you're an individual and you're unique and that reflects in your creative work because when you draw or you tell a story it's all that individuality bubbling up you do things the way you do them not the way someone else does and if everybody here drew a lion along with me each one would look a little different and that's why I want to challenge you to turn off the television and close the door so the only voice that you hear is the voice inside you telling you what to draw and what looks good because I think you'll be very happy to have a creative project that no one in the world can do, just you. So thank you very much. <laughs>